Thank you, Mr. Yockum. Uh, now would like to recognize for five minutes a friend from Oklahoma, Josh Burkeen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Young, thank you. Um, I'm at the tail end, so I, I know you've been through a grueling process. Um, I'm, I'm looking at the 22 uh, budget from the president, so just to kind of put this in context, we're talking a couple of years ago, and in, in noticing that you all have, have uh, said that you're gonna save three trillion over the next 10 year window, and the way that you're doing that is you're, you're saying the CBO, if we change nothing, gets us to a $20 trillion total debt load by deficit spending within 10 years, which would put our national debt at $50 trillion in 10 years, to go from 30 trillion to $50 trillion. And you're saying that, that uh, we'll still grow trillions of dollars in our debt, we just won't get to 20 trillion, we'll get to 17 trillion, thus a $3 trillion um, reduction over the baseline. Is that accurate? Uh, that is one way to say it. Okay, so in, in looking at that, I, we're looking at the 2022 budget from a few years ago, we're in the first year change, you all laid out a 10-year window and you had a $100 billion increase from one year to the next, and then you averaged about $15 billion increase year after year. So what you did was you front-loaded a large increase and then for the next several years, you averaged 15 billion. The reason why I'm pointing that out is in this budget, there's a very similar uh, tactic that you, go, you move from one year to the next of $150 billion the next year 75 billion, and then you project a 1.7% increase, which is 35 billion over the next you know, seven, eight years. So what, you, what you've done is you say, we're gonna increase a massive amount the first two years, but then we're gonna slow it to 1.7% growth of government versus the first couple of years, if we average it from two years ago, it's been 7%. So my question is this, the greatest predictor of future behavior is past behavior. How is this not a gimmick and how is this, leading to $3 trillion in savings ever gonna be realized when your past is gonna predict your future. If you've averaged 7% growth in government, and you can say, hey, we'll get our savings in year two, three, and four, five, six, seven, and eight, by only growing 1.7%, is that not a gimmick? So I'll point out our $3 trillion in savings are heavily tied to our revenue proposals. Those are not plugs. They are analyzed, scored uh, by career staff at Department of Treasury uh, mostly. Uh, the growth in Medicare, Social Security, and other entitlements, we get those estimates uh, from our agencies like the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. So I say that to say, you know, our, our level of uh, being able to manipulate these things are, are not high. The vast majority are scored that way. Now, it depends on how we develop our policies. Are some of our policies uh, earlier years implementation? Yes. Um, but that is how we are proposing uh, developing those, those policies. It's not meant to be a gimmick. It is just our view of how best to implement them. Some are actually the opposite way, where we Reclaiming slowly Reclaiming my ramp time. Can, sure, I'm I, sorry. I, I, I just, I'm watching the clock, and there's a new member trying to figure out how to manage my time here, Mr. Chairman. So I, I would just say that I, I do, I'm not saying that other administrations haven't done this. I would just contend, if you look at the history and look at the future, then at 7%, it actually, instead of saving $3 trillion, it actually adds $2 trillion more above the baseline. So I just contend, I, I think it's a, a great way to get the numbers we want for our purposes of looking like we're saving money, but I contend it's, it's, it's not ever gonna be realized and it's gonna be greater than this. Let me ask you this. We, we know uh, uh, Congressman Norman uh, mentioned $3 billion for, for, is gonna be added in your budget proposal for gender equity. Climate change mentioned 42 times. LGBTQ mentioned seven times. You all are taxing on the death tax. You're doubling the, the death tax for farmers and ranchers. Um, I'm a, a little small ranch. My family lost a sizable piece of property years ago on my mother's side because of the death tax. You all claim that you're not going to see an increase for those who, who uh, a tax increase for those who make above uh, 400,000. The average rancher farmer, according to USDA, um, makes 92,000 or less, and um, and and that's. So how is, can you guarantee uh, the, the American people that a, a doubling of the death tax is not gonna be borne by the, the farmers and ranchers uh, who make on average less than $92,000 per year? This president has an ironclad commitment. Those making under 400,000 uh, will not see more taxes. I think you were talking about a stepped up basis plan and certainly uh, those smaller farms are exempt 
uh, from that. And uh, you have my commitment to, to work to make sure we do common sense policies, uh, but we've got to do something to make sure uh, that larger corporations, no matter what business they're in, uh, pay more into the system to make sure we can save those small family farms. Uh, Mr. Chair, I just need to say, I contend that the small, small farmer and rancher will pay it. It will be borne by those who make a small amount of money, who keep assets in their land value. And uh, I, I just think it's uh, misguided to think the farmer and rancher, the average person making a small amount, is not going to pay this tax. I think the gentleman from Oklahoma is.